worrying when somebody says uh, he needs no introduction because for very many years, uh, when I used to be on television, I would go somewhere to talk to people in the real world rather than through the lens of the camera. And uh, I'd be talking to them like this, I'm talking to you now. And round about this time, I would look around and I'd see somebody nudging their neighbour. And it took me about 10 years to discover why this happened again and again and again. And what I discovered, because I actually went and asked somebody, what were you saying to the person who's next to you? And she said, well, what I said to him was, you brought me here, you told me some bloke called Trevor was going to talk to you, but this is not the bloke who reads the news at 10, is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, this was... Uh, a Britain of the past, you would think. However, I have to say, this happened to me just six months ago. So, um, if I had ever had any uh, any likelihood of um, having becoming, you know, swell-headed about what a special person I was, I keep meeting people who think that actually the only reason that they're ready to let me waste their time is because I'm actually somebody else. Um, I'm also <laughs> rather conscious that. Um, what you're really here to do is get your certificate and go out and enjoy yourself. As David Frost, the late David Frost, uh, once said that uh, he'd been speaking, or he'd been booked to speak at a lunch, and he was sitting there and everybody was having a jolly lunch and they're eating their lunch and they were chatting and they were having a drink and so on. And a chap who organised the lunch came across to him and said, uh, well, Sir David, are you ready to speak now, or can we let them go on enjoying themselves? <laughs> so, um, I will try to be uh, as relatively brief as I can. First of all, let me say congratulations to everybody. I think it's, it's fantastic. Uh, this programme is fantastic. I think it's, well, it's been going now for how many years? Seven. Seven years. And every year it seems to be bigger and bolder and produce... Uh, what look like and a smarter cohort of people but we will find out when we come to Q&A, <laughs> won't we? Um, I want to say, before anything else, thank you to Stephen for the immense leadership that he's given to Three Face Forum, setting it uh, absolutely on the road to the right place and giving it solidity and strength, <coughs> which, let's remember, this is a charity. Nobody pays for this to happen. So it takes conviction and persuasion. And uh, I would say thank you to Michael, who's been my friend for many, many years, um, longer than he's been uh, the, the chair here, but who has kept me involved. Uh, and of course, though he's not here, to Michael's father for really being the inspiration behind all of this. And of course, to the staff uh, who make all this happen. Now, over the time that Three Face Forum has existed, its mission, I think, has become more and more important. Um, of course, people like me have been uh, prodding from the sidelines and worrying about what's the right thing and so on. But there is one fundamental truth about this country, and which is, by the way, becoming true about the whole of Europe and, indeed, North America, which has made its work more and more urgent and to some extent explains why I do and have done what I do. Uh, some of you may have read, I know that you all uh, no doubt religiously follow the outpourings of the 797 think tanks that uh, exist around here. Uh, so you will have seen the policy exchange uh, report a few weeks ago, which was essentially, uh, as you know, as you will know, policy exchange made basically David Cameron's favorite think tank, so it matters what they say. Uh, the most important thing about its report on minority Britain, which is what it really was uh, about, was the projection for what Britain will look like over the next 30 to 35 years. And the essential figure is that somewhere between, uh, by 2050, somewhere between a fifth and two fifths of the population will be from minorities. Now that changes the game. Dramatically, It changes the notion of what it means to be British. It doesn't necessarily have to pit people at each other's throats, but it changes what we are as a nation. And that has enormous consequences for all sorts of things. And principally, I want to just say a few words about 
religion and politics, which of course is what this program and what you guys are all about. We, we are actually here at the confluence of religion and politics. In some ways, what we've got here is quite symbolic. Down the road, we've got the first two great estates, House of Lords, House of Commons, the landed aristocracy, or they used to be, uh, and the People's Assembly and all of that. Uh, and we also have, within five minutes' walk of this room, pretty much, uh, some of the great symbols of our religious estate, Westminster Abbey, and Westminster Cathedral, the Methodist Central Hall. The list kind of stops there. And the fact that the list of religious places stops there tells us something about where we are as a country, because in the heart of this confluence of religion and politics, this concentration of power, you don't yet see the institutions that represent la large and growing parts of the British people. So that's point one I want to make about this. We are ruled and we are guided by religion and politics, but at the heart of our religious, religious and political establishment, we still yet have not yet as a country got to grips with the fact that we are a different country to the one that we were when these places were founded. And that is the burden, I guess, of what I most want to say to all of you. I know it's typical, this is like school speech day, isn't it, where somebody comes along and pats you on the head fig figuratively, and well, figuratively these days, uh, not like patting <laughs> on the head of children, I hope, um, but pats you on the head and says how wonderful you are, how marvellous you are going to be, and how much you're going to uh, gain from, how much you gain from these programmes and all that stuff. Well, forgive me if I don't do that. You know all of that. You know what you've gained from this. What I want to talk to you about it is what you are going to do for this country. What is your contribution? And by the way, uh, let me be absolutely blunt about it, what is going to be your responsibility? You're here because you're good. You're smart. You're effective. You wouldn't be in this room if you weren't. And that puts a special responsibility on you to use that cleverness, that nounce, that capability to make some of the dreams that we have about this country realise. I want to say something about the... I said something about the gap in religion. Just, if I may say something about the gap in politics, it's very straightforward. The other thing that we learned from the <coughs> policy exchange report, if we didn't know it already, 14% population, minority... We currently have, amongst our members of Parliament, 27 out of, what is it now, 658, uh, who are from ethnic minorities. Uh, if my maths hasn't deserted me, we ought to, if it were proportional, have something like 90. That means we've got a deficit of over 70, over 60, I beg your pardon, <coughs> uh, MPs in that respect. Now, first of all, fix that in your mind. Those of you who want to be members of Parliament, First of all, God help you. But secondly, <laughs> if you are fixed on it, if you are fixed on it, that's the gap that you are going to help us close. I want to say a few words about both of these things. Because part of our problem is that in this society, religion and politics, which are the two great streams that have shaped British life, its morality, which to some extent tell us what is right and what is wrong in our society. Both of them have, for a variety of reasons, some similar, some not, become somewhat polluted, I think is probably the right word. There are reasons why in both cases, both religion and politics have, been, have lost their weight and their force in, poli poli uh, in public life. I think someone needs to make the case or the continuing weight and significance of both of these elements to our national life. And I hope that because you've been in this particular programme, you will be part of the group that begins to make that case. Because I think that without a moral sense in politics, actually politics is nothing other than party management. And uh, frankly, 
without the relationship of uh, religion to politics, religion is nothing but ritual. So these two things are absolutely essential to bring together. And you guys, from your own backgrounds, from your experience, and from what you've done here, I think can teach the rest of us some lessons. On religion, it's now become a bit fashion. It's become fashionable to decry uh, religion as a thing of the past, as a kind of superstition. That people of faith really are kidding themselves. Well, I don't know how many of you hold that point of view. I don't, uh, and I don't for a very straightforward reason. Um, you won't know anything much about my background, but I uh, was brought up partly here, partly in the Caribbean, most in the Caribbean actually. Uh, I came to university here when I was 17, far too young. I discovered things that a 17 year old should never have discovered about London, um, but anyway, I got through it. Uh, I was a chemist, I was a scientist, I was trained as a scientist. Um, I then became a journalist, really, by, because I idleness, I think is the right word to put it, I was too uh, idle to be a proper scientist. And I became a politician for a while uh, by accident. Now, I experienced all of those things, but all the way through, my groundings in my family as a Methodist family, my grounding in uh, faith and belief were extremely important. I mean, I learned my music. Uh, I'm a great believer in the value of music. I learned my music in church. Uh, I learned uh, the importance of the narrative, which is, you will all know, is absolutely the center of political endeavor these days through Bible studies. And I learned the power of the word listening to preachers. Uh, all of you will know that actually that is the place where the word can move, can mobilize and of course it's one of the things that we miss most of all in politics, the capacity uh, for leaders to use the word to mobilize belief. I also happen to believe, by the way, that without faith there's very little hope. I, I always wonder, and I have this argument with a lot of my friends on the, on the left, how it is that you, if you believe that you know everything and you believe that everything can be explained by our uh, minds and by science, uh, why you bother to want to change things? Because actually, if we know everything that's been known, what is there to be hoped for? Actually, I start from, and everybody I think pretty much knows where I am politically, I start from the premise that we can hope for something better, this world or the next. We can hope for something better. And politics is a means of getting us closer to that better place. So my point very simply about the whole issue of faith and religion is never be tempted to let go, whether you are devout, you're observant or not, but never be tempted to let go of that central notion that belief in something better is what drives your political involvement. And if that isn't what drives your political involvement, what you are is a bureaucrat get out, make some money in somewhere immoral. In politics, you're there because you want things to be better. But when I turn to politics itself, I mentioned the issue of rising diversity, and one of the immediate issues, one of the immediate row and argument about immigration and all that, let's just be absolutely straight. Over the period of your political lives, this is not going to stop. Western societies are going to become more diverse. There may be ups and downs, there may be tightening, there may be this one, that one, but over the next 30 or 40 years, Europe, America, will become more diverse by ethnicity. And there's a big reason for that. Uh, the Japanese Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, has recently taken on the most difficult thing that a Japanese Prime Minister could do. He has made the argument that one of the reasons for Japan's 25-year stagnation, economic stagnation, is that A, they are the oldest developed society in the world, and B, they refuse, as a society, to countenance immigration because, and there have been po polls on this in Japan, 
if you asked the Japanese, if you asked Japanese people, would you prefer growth and prosperity, or would you prefer to remain pure? At the moment, they still choose to be pure and poor. Now, this is a madness that cannot go on forever. And uh, Abe, who has done a pretty terrific job in the economy, is trying to explain to and sell to Japanese people they've got to change. But that's true all over Europe, so true all over uh, North America. You know, there is a sense that at the moment that, and you'll have read it in the last couple of weeks because of election results and so on, that the British people are somehow, if you scratch them, they're a bunch of closet racists. Well, I just don't believe that. I just don't buy it. Uh, again, because you read the political press, you'll have read the work that was published by The Guardian last week, which says that a quarter of the population will say that they are a little or very prejudiced. And this has been interpreted as saying, you know, racism is on the up in the UK. I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. And it's, the numbers don't tell you that. Actually, they tell you something quite different. If you uh, dig into them, what you discover is that 3% of people say, I'm very prejudiced, if asked about them, their, their own self-assessed level of prejudice. 24% say, I'm a little prejudiced. Now, what I think that is actually telling us is something entirely different. What it's telling us is that 24% of people say, are saying, you know what, I grew up in a household where my parents would say, we don't like that particular group of people, or we think that bunch are a little bit dodgy. And I know there's something in me which has grown up with that. And, you know, private meetings, so let me be completely honest with you. I don't know if any Nigerians in the room? <laughs> okay. Well, let me tell you, in my family, bad man, really bad. My sister had the privilege of marrying uh, a Nigerian gentleman. Bad move. But it wasn't because he was Nigerian, it's because he's a bad guy. But the point <laughs> is, but, but the point, I'm telling you that, I'm telling you that for this reason, that actually it confirmed every prejudice that my family had. Now, it was ridiculous, and it is ridiculous. But if somebody were to say to me, do you think you've got any prejudices? I would be lying if I did not say, you know what, I grew up hearing day in, day out about this particular bunch of people, and I'm just not sure that I don't, you know, immediately react in a particular way. Now, I think that that 24% of people were saying, we acknowledge. And frankly, that to me is 100 miles on from where we were 25 years ago, when people would answer that question and either lie or just shout. Whereas now we're in a society where people are prepared to accept, you know, the stuff I don't like about myself. My point here is a very simple one, that actually we are changing as a society, but maybe our institutions aren't changing uh, as they should do. We know that there's, frankly, some panic across Europe about the advance of some anti-immigrant, what we describe as far-right parties, um, I think that there are issues here, but the real danger, and this is why you guys are incredibly important, is not that UKIP is going to be in government. They are not. What the real danger of all of this is, is the way they make everybody else behave. You've all seen it at school. Most of us are normal at school. Most of us kind of behave like reasonable human beings. But there are some moments where you know, there's always some, somebody right at the edge of the class or the gang who is a bit crazy, will go over the edge, will be a bully or something like that. And the problem is not that everybody else is, is like that, but that actually we all sort of stand by or we all edge along or because, because they have the strongest feeling, they shout loudest, we all kind of edge along or turn a blind eye. Now that... That is where politics really has to gain traction. To say, okay, we recognize, we can hear the noise, but we aren't going to give in to it. Politics doesn't have to join in. And if I may just make a, say a quick word about that specific issue of uh, immigration so on, uh, as an example, you know, it's now uh, becoming the 
smart thing to say, well, we've got to recognize the British people are worried about this and so on. In the Western world, there are only two political parties, both in government, who have succeeded in dealing with immigration politically. They are the governments of Canada and the government of Germany. The things that this <coughs> government have in common are they have been their prime ministers, Stephen Harper and Angela Merkel, have been there a long time. Secondly, they are popular. Thirdly, they are centre-right governments. Fourthly, they are the countries with the highest level and increasing levels of immigration in the Western world. The Canadians, their net immigration is something like a quarter of a million a year. The Germans, at the moment, 437,000 net immigrants. A million immigrants came to Germany last year. Why are they successful? Because both Harper and Merkel have made the point, made the case that I described uh, Shinzo Abe making directly to the Canadian and German people. They've been honest about it, they've been straight about it, they haven't mucked about it with it, and they have, intr they have introduced programs of integration, of which, by the way, Parliament, the Parliamentary's program would be a great example, which deal with the inevitable frictions that come with many different kinds of people occupying the same place. From your own experience, from what you've done on this program, what I hope is that over the next few years, you guys are going to be the people who come along and say, actually, the story that you, the old politics, is telling isn't the story that we want to inherit. It's not the politics that we want to characterize our careers in public life. Because of your experience, because of where you live. I want to just make one last point, which is about how you can practice. And I understand there's some of you, as I said, who may want to be members of parliament. Well, good. We've got this fantastic deficit. There are 16 minority Labour MPs. There are 11 Conservatives. We've, uh, I have a little team who do number crunching on these kinds of things. And we've done some rather interesting number crunching. To start with, those numbers, 27 minority MPs, mean that as a society we're underperforming by about 70% where we should be. You know, uh, I don't know how many of you got first and then whatnot. You wouldn't get a degree if you're underperforming by 70%, so we're failing. Secondly, uh, someone referred to a democratic deficit. I think it's a very, very important phrase. It's a really important phrase. And we've done a, we did a little sum. Of course, you know, everybody elects their local member of parliament. And on average, every parliament, every MP is elected by about 68,000 electors. Well, we played a little uh, thought, we had a little thought experiment. If you put the minority MPs in a stadium or a district with all of the minority voters, how many of them would it take to elect each of those minority MPs? And everybody else, how much, many of them would it take to make, take those, elect those other MPs? Well, on average, there are about 44,000 people who vote for every MP. Uh, if you just divided the, the room or the, the country the way I talked about, you would find that it takes less than 40,000 white electors to elect a white MP. It takes more than 120,000 minority MPs uh, electors to elect a minority MP. If that isn't a democratic deficit, I just can't tell you what it is, what one is. So, the good news is that every one of you that gets elected will redu reduce that deficit of 120,000 odd to 40,000 by a good few thousand. So, uh, congratulations to whoever got their council seat. Uh, and I expect and hope to see more of you uh, in that line. Uh, I'm also supposed to give you some good advice uh, on what to do. Well, I mean, honestly, uh, I'm probably the worst person in the entire world to give anybody advice about, certainly about how to be nice. So um, I'm not even going to try to do that. Here are some tips. The worst thing about politicians is, I was just saying, talking to Michael about this, the worst thing about politicians is that they are, you, you can usually tell who they are. 
because they are the people <coughs> that you never want to get caught in the kitchen with at a party. They are dull, they are earnest, they fix you and you just want to get away. Don't turn into one of them. Continue to have fun. Enjoy your life. You can be serious about your politics, but don't make it uh, make you less than a human being. Second, when you get into a leadership position, you're never going to do this by us all by yourself. One of the most important things that uh, it took me a long time to learn, by the way, and I wish I'd known it 20 years earlier. The most important thing you can have is a bunch of people who are near you, around you. Sometimes they work for you, sometimes they're your friends. But the important thing about them is that they have permission, and they know they have permission, to tell you that you are being an ass. <laughs> it's a very, very important thing that they, you must have people who are there who have the confidence, the capability, and the credibility with you to tell you, don't do that, man. Don't wear that tie, because you know what? Somebody, the worst thing, the least, the, the hardest thing for a politician to hear is this. You know what? You want to say that, don't you? Yeah. You think it's really going to go down well, don't you? Yeah. I agree. It would go down well if somebody else was saying it. But you know what? You are going to fall on your face. Don't do it. You need people who are near you who can tell you not just not to do stuff, but that actually you can't do this stuff. Somebody else might, but you can't. And that's a really hard lesson to hear. But let me tell you from now, it is the most useful lesson that you will ever have. Third thing I want to say is uh, specialise. The people in leadership positions who really succeed are the people who become indispensable because they are really good at something. They might be good at writing, they may be good at a particular subject, they may be good at strategy. But work out what you are really great at and really work hard at being the best, the best at that thing. Don't try to do everything. Don't try to be, you know, there'll be people who get to be stars very quickly. Generally speaking, unless they're geniuses, they don't last. You know, one of the, the, one of the worst things, that, the most difficult things about the great Blair Brown thing was nobody thought that Tony Blair was ever going to be the number one. Actually, actually, he was, and he was always going to be, because he knew what to do. So my third bit of advice to you is work out really quite carefully, and take advice about this, what you're really good at, and do that thing to the best of your ability. And the last piece I want to say is this. Do not be afraid of conflict. One of the things that oh, people always do in politics is tell you, yeah, yeah, you probably, you know, you've got, uh, you know, you want to have, you don't like something, you want to say something about it. Well, okay, nobody wants to be gratuitously rude or have a fight when you don't have to have a fight. But sometimes you have to have a fight. That is the point about leadership. Leadership is about choice. If we didn't have to make choices, we would not have to have leaders. We'd just get on and do it ourselves. Nothing's more irritating than somebody who purports to be a leader and who is always saying, tell me what you want me to do. <laughs> you know, leaders are not people, they respect their followers, they listen to them, they try to make sure that as many people as possible are satisfied. But never put yourself in a position where you have convinced yourself that because everybody's smiling at you, that you're winning. Let me tell you, they all hate you. <laughs> be absolutely clear. And be magnanimous to people who are on the other side. Respect their opinion, because generally speaking, their opinions are as strong and often as valid as yours. They're just different. Do not disrespect your opponents. But absolutely do not run away from an argument. Because actually, if you want to be in politics, if you want to be a leader, that is why you're there. And if you pretend that that's, you know, that's not what you're there for, people will find you out and they will discard you. So be polite, be respectful, be loving where that's possible. But always, always make your choice. That's it. <laughs>